Thank you, Dr. Masani. Thank you, Dr. Masani, and good morning, everyone. I know that y'all had a, a quite a morning packed with a lot of information, and it's sometimes hard to keep it all, but uh, I'll go through my presentation, and uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box, and afterwards, we can certainly answer some of your questions. Uh, my topic will basically be uh, tomato pest management for the homeowner, uh, not for commercial uh, production. Um, so it'll be basically, I'll be giving information or pesticides for the homeowner. Again, that's my contact information, but of course you can always contact Dr. Masabni and he can get your questions to me. <clears throat> First, I'll start off with probably what's the most devastating uh, problem in our tomatoes and in my part of the world. I'm, in, I'm, the, the, uh, I'm the extension vegetable specialist for the southern tip of Texas, uh, basically from south of Corpus, south of San Antonio, uh, south of uh, uh, Del Rio, all the way down to Brownsville, Texas. So the most devastating uh, tomato problem that we face in this area, and I'm sure to some degree you all face it in East Texas, is because some of these transplants may originate uh, from from these places, and they may be bringing a problem uh, to, to to your home garden. And obviously, if you have a tomato that looks like this, as you can tell by the picture, uh, the leaves are not well formed; they're actually tiny. Uh, the plant is stunted. Uh, you know, it's you can obviously tell this is an unhealthy uh, tomato plant and unlikely to get any any production at all. Uh, from this tomato plant based on how seriously it is infected. This uh, particular virus is called the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Uh, it's you know been around since the 1990s, so it's not something that's, um, that's new, but it's been around a while and it's created big problems. And really the primary reason we don't grow commercial tomatoes for the most part here in the Rio Grande Valley. <clears throat> The main culprit of this vir virus is that it is transmitted by an insect. And that insect that transmits that virus can be called the silver leaf or the sweet potato whitefly. So there's a picture there of the, of the whitefly itself. It's obviously this is an enlarged uh, picture. So it looks big, but actually when you're in your, in your garden with tomatoes, you're gonna see like these little white gnats flying around. And obviously they're probably not gonna sit still for you to take a picture, but uh, they're, they're, they're really small. And, uh, and the, this is the insect that transmits this virus. Uh, basically uh, this insect has six life stages and included in those life stages, there's an egg. There's four um, uh, nymphal instars and I'll show a picture of that. And of course the adult stage. And so obviously when we're trying to control uh, this insect, we are targeting primarily the adults, but in some cases we are trying to get some of the um, insecticides, for example, on those nymphs uh, to kill them. And the best way to do that is with something that would be systemic, something that would move through the tomato plant and, uh, and kill uh, that, uh, that instar, that nymphal instar. And again, these guys can really reproduce quick if conditions are right. Uh, they can go from egg to adult in two weeks. So in 14 days, you went from an egg to an adult. As you can quickly see under the right conditions, you can have many, many white fly and it takes very few white fly to transmit the virus uh, once the virus is either present in other tomatoes or present in the weeds near your garden that could be carrying it. Matter of fact, we've uh, down here in the Rio Grande Valley just recently, we our plant pathologist, uh, He's a virologist by training. He found this, um, this uh, tomato yellow leaf curl virus in papaya plants, which had never been found in papayas. So again, so when we think about this virus, calling it tomato yellow leaf curl virus, yes, it affects tomatoes, but it can actually, we'll say, survive in other plant hosts. And this white fly does have many plant hosts as well. This is that immature uh, nymph stage that I mentioned. As you can see, it looks uh, totally different than the adult stage. You wouldn't even suspect uh, uh, these 
to, I guess, uh, develop into an adult white fly, but they do. They're sessile or immobile. So once they're there, they basically are attached to the underside of the leaf and they're uh, with their mouth parts or piercing and sucking uh, the plant the juices to provide uh, nourishment for them. So uh, again, you're gonna basically, you're gonna find this stage exclusively on the underside of the leaves and the adult white flies, of course, are gonna try to be on the underside, but you could see them on top of the leaves as well. So some of the damage that the white fly can do, obviously they can up, just the white fly themselves can damage the tomatoes. Maybe not, uh, maybe you didn't, they didn't have the virus with them. They weren't carrying the virus or transmitting the virus. If you have excessive amount of white fly, they can cause a, um, uh, a physiological condition in the plant that we call uneven ripening. Meaning, for, uh, you know, it's believed that the saliva of the adult white fly has some kind of toxins or some kind of protein or something, but not a virus that's affecting the plant physiologically, which does not allow the tomatoes to basically ripen evenly. So you have this uneven ripening and they don't ripen very well. So you can have outright damage by high white fly numbers, or you can have damage of the white, by the white fly because they are transmitting this tomato yellow leaf curl virus. So what can we do? Uh, obviously we wanna manage it. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to see the reason I included uh, that abbreviation, that TYLCV, is that's the abbreviation you're going to want to see in your seed packets or the or the varieties of to the tomatoes that you grow. You're going to look for that abbreviation to see if they have a, 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 a tolerance or a resistance. So there are some tomatoes out there uh, commercially available to homeowners that do have some resistance and tolerance. Some that come to my mind real easily is Celebrity and Tycoon. Uh, they both, I know Tycoon is a superstar plant this year and I believe Celebrity in past years has been a uh, superstar plant as well. So, and part of that reason is because they perform well all over Texas. And part of that reason of them performing well all over Texas is because they have that, uh, that tolerance or resistance to the uh, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Normally the varieties that have TY in their name, like Celebrity, TY at the end, and Tycoon, uh, the TY in front, the companies have kind of gotten together and said, we're gonna try to at least let people know that these varieties have some uh, resistance slash tolerance to the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. However, recently I've seen tomatoes with different names that don't have the TY in their name and they are resistant to the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. So I guess the companies, you know, at first got together and said, this is what we're gonna do. I guess now they've kind of gone their own way. So you do wanna look at that, that packet and, and, and grow those tomatoes that are resistant to this if you've had past problems with this. And maybe you haven't had past problems but if you do buy transplants, wherever you may get them, uh, that white fly and that virus may be coming from those greenhouse sources, especially if they came from some central or South Texas uh, location. Again, that's one way to manage or uh, mitigate your, your virus problem. Now, if you wanna control the white fly, and we're talking about all the stages, the eggs, dams, and adults, uh, you may want to spray. And uh, you want to spray, I would say, once you observe them, once you start seeing the little white uh, gnats or the white fly flying around, you'd want to take action. Um, some organic uh, possibilities is insecticidal soaps. Uh, you can find them at your local nurseries, uh, your big uh, retail outlets, and of course, your seed catalogs, uh, for example, like Johnny's. And there's uh, what I'll call summer oils. Those are oils you can use in summer, not dormant spray oils, because if you spray a dormant spray oil in the middle of the summer on your tomatoes, well, you're gonna kill them. It's, that oil is too toxic. So you wanna use the correct oils. Uh, and they, some of them are 
uh, certified organic. Uh, other types of oils like neem oil are also organic. So that would fall into the oil. So oils and soaps, you wanna have good coverage. You wanna basically cover that insect. So it does damages to basically its breathing apparatus in order to kill it. Those would be or organic um, type method. Now, if um, you're okay with spraying man-made uh, chemicals or synthetic uh, insecticides, uh, there is a Bayer fruit, citrus, and vegetable spray. It does have the um, uh, synthetic insecticide called imidacloprid, and that is systemic. So you could uh, you apply this, you, you could apply it foliarly, or you could apply it to the soil and the roots will take it up into the plant and actually kill the nymphs and kill the adults. Uh, it's basically one of the products that is used commercially. I would caution you, uh, you know, Bayer makes so many, uh, there's so many Bayer uh, products. It has to be the one that says Bayer fruit, citrus, vegetable spray. Otherwise it doesn't have imidacloprid. If you get just the Bayer vegetable spray, that's a totally different chemical, doesn't have imidacloprid. So, you know, when I do put these things up there, it's pretty much exactly how it has to be. And that would be labeled for home garden use. And as always, uh, read and follow the directions on the label on how to use it uh, safely and also effectively for your uh, pest problem. Another problem that does come up in tomatoes, not so much in South Texas, but many parts of East Texas and, and Southeastern United States is tomato spotted wilt virus. And tomato spotted wilt virus, again, is one of those viruses that's gonna be insect transmitted. But before I get to the culprit that transmits that insect, uh, the photo to your left there is the really concentric rings. You can almost uh, see the target. You could sometimes even see this symptom on fruits. I've seen it on watermelons. I've seen it on papayas. So you can see this tomato spotted wilt virus uh, with these very concentric rings is very characteristic of the virus itself. Again, maybe you won't get the rings on the fruit, but you will get the splotchiness, the splotchy fruit, the fruit again, didn't develop correctly. And that's probably just, a, uh, you know, something a gardener is gonna observe first that, you know, the tomatoes were all splotchy and didn't develop correctly. Again, you'd want to get a diagnosis of what actually caused it. But one uh, example, uh, you know, one uh, culprit of that would be your tomato spotted wilt virus. This virus, like the previous virus, is transmitted by an insect. But in this case, it's a different insect. This generally thrips transmitted, but the Western flower thrip is the thrip that is considered the most effective in transmitting uh, this virus. Um, Again, there's so many different species of thrips uh, out there. There's Western flower thrips, there's Eastern flower th thrips, there's um, tobacco thrips. I mean, there's just so many thrips out there and they get on a variety of plants that uh, you're probably not gonna know which exact species you have without it being identified, but just be aware that thrips are the cause of the transmission of the virus and one particular type of damage that thrips do besides transmitting the virus is this silvering da damage. As you see in the picture to the right on the leaf, they'll basically with their mouth parts that we call rasping and sucking mouth parts will rasp or cut into the leaf tissue and suck the juices. And it kind of leaves this silvering uh, whitish look on. So it's pretty characteristic of their feeding when you see it on the leaves and you know you have thrips or ex excessive uh, number of thrips, uh, at least um, uh, damaging the leaves. Again, we wanna manage both the virus and the thrip, just like the tomato yellow leaf curl. We wanna plant those varieties that would be resistant or tolerant to tomato spotted wilt virus. Again, in the seed packet, you'd wanna look that the seed packets would say that it is resistant to TSWV. They don't spell it out for you. They just put the 
initials, especially if you go to one of the seed catalogs and you have to go back to the index to see what it, what it stands for, but it'd be TSWB. Uh, varieties that are uh, resistant to it is BH444. Uh, I know at one time that was a, also a Texas superstar uh, tomato plant. Um, uh, it, it's uh, back uh, about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, looking on the catalogs for it, it's hard to find that seed, but there is a, now there is a BHN1021, and that is resistant to the tomato spotted wilt. And uh, another variety would be Top Gun. I know uh, in San Antonio, they do the tomato rodeo, and that at least in one year, if not several years, has been the top producing uh, tomato. So there are many other varieties as well that have tomato spotted wilt virus. But if you do know that you're battling that, be looking for those varieties that are adapted to Texas, do well in Texas, and at the same time have resistance to the particular problem you're trying to solve. Again, we, if we wanna spray the uh, thrip in all its stages, it has immature stages as well. Uh, you want to uh, begin your spraying once you observe uh, some feeding, as I mentioned, it'd be the, uh, pretty much very similar to the white fly, insecticidal soap, and the summer oils would be your organic type uh, choices, uh, even uh, neem oil. But there is an organic certified product called Spinosit uh, that's sold as Intrust that you could buy as a homeowner, well, you know, from your local uh, seed catalogs, and that is. Uh, effective on thrips as well, as well as other insects. But those would be kind of your choices uh, for the managing your thrips. And now we'll get to what I'll call most uh, tomatoes uh, uh, homeowners uh, dread, and that's the grouping that I'll call the worms. And of course, uh, the first and foremost worm is the tomato hornworm, which is this great big gigantic worm that you may have come across in your garden. Of course, they have that thing at the end there, as you see in the picture uh, to your bottom left that we'll call the horn. Uh, and this particular horn, horn worm is feeding on a tomato fruit, but probably a classic sign or symptom is they'll eat your whole tomato plant. Meaning if you look at that picture to the right, if you start seeing sticks in your, on your plant, uh, and somewhere there is a tomato horn worm and they camouflage themselves so well. I've looked at tomato plants and I'm looking for the horn worm and I'm, you know, putting my hands on the tomato plant and I'm my hands right next to the horn, horn worm and I can't even see it till I either push it or, or you know, feel it. So uh, they can camouflage themselves there and they almost look like a stem. But if you see this, you see your tomato plant that is all gobbled down or partially gobbled down missing points, uh, you probably have a tomato hornworm uh, issue in your garden. I'll go on with more uh, worms or lepidopter worms uh, that are problems in the garden before I mention control, because the control with chemicals will be basically the same for all these worms. The next one is, of course, probably the most famous of the worms, and that is the tomato fruit worm. Uh, one thing as gardeners I want you to know is that uh, the fruit worm, uh, this fruit worm, feeds on many crops. It's also known as the corn earworm when it's attacking corn. It's also known as the cotton bowl worm when it's attacking the bowls of cotton. So just realize that if you have a sweet corn uh, next to your tomatoes and uh, you know, you're know you gonna have probably something attracting uh, this tomato fruit worm to your garden and they're gonna make their way to your garden and basically be feeding on many of your crops in your garden, including other crops such as beans, uh, snap beans, green beans. So just be aware that this particular insect pest uh, that basically goes straight for the tomato fruit is, uh, has other hosts as well. Again, lumping the, the worm complex, we have army worms, okay? And they're different than fruit worms. Uh, the fruit worms, for example, uh, the moth, it's a moth, uh, comes and lays their eggs singly. So they will be just, we'll say one worm. It lays multiple single eggs in various places, but the eggs are laid singly. So you're just gonna find, I'll say a few. 
there's just going to be one fruit, you know, corn airworm in a corn and one fruit worm on a tomato fruit. For army worms, the moth lays the eggs in clusters, large egg clusters, hundreds, you know, hundreds of eggs. So in this case, you'll have lots and lots of worms hatch out. Uh, and that's part of the reason that they're called army worms because they're coming in an army in, in large numbers. And there are many types of army worms, uh, yellow striped army worms, there's beet army worms. Uh, so there's many army worms, but the, again, when you see lots of worms um, attacking your tomato plant, you probably have some type of army worm. For us, our biggest culprit is the beet army worm and not so much as the yellow striped army worm, but maybe in East Texas, it's the yellow striped army worms that attack your tomatoes. Another Lepidopterum pest that we is quite prolific in our area in South Texas, and I'm sure it makes its way through most of the United States, and that is called the tomato pinworm. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you've ever noticed uh, or if you have tomato pinworm problems in your area, but if you see like a leaf that's rolled up and then you break open that leaf that's rolled up and there's a worm, uh, they actually uh, basically kind of close up that leaf and, and start to feed on the, um, on the leaf itself and, and basically get under the first layer of the plant cells that we'll call an epidermis. And they kind of, it's kind of that what protects them. And, uh, but their real damage, what they'll do is they'll actually get on the calyx or, or the stem part of the tomato fruit and it'll actually start to burrow into the tomato fruit and can be quite damaging. I don't have a picture of damage of pinworms to tomato fruit, but they basically start in the foliage and go to the fruit. And once in the foliage, if you find this rolled up tomato leaves and you pop out uh, uh, this um, kind of striped worm, uh, that's gonna be a tomato pinworm. And if you have worms under the calyx, feeding immediately under that stem, uh, those are tomato pinworms. It can be quite problematic. Now we're gonna look at the whole worm complex and how we're gonna manage them. So generally, when you start to find them, it's gonna be time to treat. And I will tell this to uh, home gardeners is most people think, well, I treat it once and that's enough. Uh, to be successful in managing um, these insects, because they don't just come one day and they're gone, they kind of continue to, the moths continue to lay eggs. Uh, you know, there's peaks and there's valleys, but they continue to, uh, to be laying eggs. So it's gonna take repeated applications. Uh, you could do them weekly, you could do them, you know, you know, at some point in time, but they're gonna take repeated applications, especially with a lot of these uh, organically certified products to accomplish what you want, and that is manage those, those worms attacking your, your tomato plant. Of course, for the tomato home, uh, horn worm, which is so large, and you're just basically gonna have one per plant, the molecule, you could probably physically squash that worm and get rid of it. Again, uh, the products that I'm gonna mention would be effective against the hornworm, uh, the fruit worms, the army worms, and the tomato pinworms. And probably the best products out there is to spray, getting good coverage, meaning uh, it's not just a very light spray. You spray where there's a large volume of water that's basically getting applied to the foliage and the fruit. And that would be with Bacillus thuringiensis or BT products. And there's so many um, uh, commercial ones, but probably one that comes to my mind right off the bat is Dipel. So Dipel is effective against these worms. Uh, reason maybe sometimes people think Dipel is not very effective is because they didn't get good coverage. The worms have to eat the Bacillus thuringiensis in order to die. And if they know an area hasn't been sprayed, well, that's where basically they go scoot to and, and not, you know, not feed on the area that has the BT. So gotta have good coverage. Another product that works on the Lepidopterum worms, as was mentioned earlier, is Phenocid. Again, the trade name there for homeowners would be Entrust. And I would, I would rotate these products. I would probably do, you know, two applications of BTs and I'd rotate 
you know, two applications to Spinosad. I would, you know, I would not just stay with one product. I would use both uh, to maximize uh, the control and also, again, be practicing uh, integrated pest management practices where we're not using one product. I know that certain lepidopteran worms have gotten resistant to spinosad. So in that case, um, you know, the spinosad is ineffective. So we want to use these products in a rotation type manner. Again, if you're okay with using uh, man-made or synthetic products, uh, the, again, if we were going to go to Bayer, it would be the Bayer vegetable insect spray. Again, in this case, it would not have imidacloprid. It would have a pyrethroid. And that, again, would be another thing to rotate with, or you know, you'd, you'd want to, you wouldn't want to just use it by itself also if you were okay using that pyrethroid. So again, if you're organic only, that'd be BTs and then trust. If you just want to con really control your worm complex and it doesn't matter to you, I would use all three products in some type of rotational manner uh, to be effective and control your tomato worm complex. Now I'll discuss other, other I'll say, I'll call sporadic type pests. Uh, first one I'll mention is aphids. And when I say sporadic means I've had, I've grown tomatoes several years, not all, not consecutively, but I've probably grown uh, in the last 10 years, the five of those years I've grown tomato crops. And some years uh, aphids show up and most years they never show up. So they're very sporadic. So uh, when they're there, they're there in full force. And when they're not there, they're not there at all. So again, you'd want to keep an eye out for them to see if you have aphids. Again, this is maybe not the best picture. They could have wings or tiny. Um, they're kind of in the same grouping as aphids. Uh, so I mean, as aphids, as sweet as the sweet potato white fly. Uh, so so similar chemicals would work on them. Uh, they're um, um, you know kind of be easy to identify if you had a hand lens and looked at them. But again, you you know, if you're not sure, uh, uh, again, these are tiny insects that yeah, you may see with the naked eye, but you're really not gonna make, make them out unless you use a hand lens. Again, in this case, uh, just uh, what's very effective against aphids is insecticidal soap and summer type oils. Again, if you get good coverage uh, with these products, uh, they're very effective against uh, the aphids. And like the white fly, if you wanted to use the Bayer citrus uh, vegetable um, spray with a metacloprid, that would also help with this, uh, with your aphids. Other, again, uh, sporadic uh, type pests, uh, stink bugs and bee-footed bugs. A picture on the left, you have a stink bug on the tomatoes and you kind of can see uh, the, some of the damage that that stink bug is doing on the tomato. Basically, everywhere it puts its um, its stylet, you know, it, it's basically its feeding part, its uh, mouth part into the fruit. It is basically being stung or stinging the fruit, and that area will be discolored. So you have discoloration uh, spots on your fruit. And the same thing would go for other uh, groups that are kind of in the same family as stink bugs and that's a leaf-footed bug. You can see in the picture on the right, uh, the back part of their foot, you can kind of distinctly see that leaf-looking foot. So that's why they're called leaf-footed bugs. Again, these guys are very sporadic. Again, sometimes they're there and they're quite problematic. And other times you don't even see them and they don't even cause any problems. And they also not only sporadic, but they can be transient, meaning they come into your tomatoes, into your garden, and then the next day or a couple of days are gone. And then you're spraying, there's really nothing to kill because they move on. So they, they tend to be rather mobile and, you know, and because they do have a wide host range of things to eat. So they're transient. So they, uh, and they're very difficult to kill as mentioned earlier. In this case, there's really no organic uh, certified uh, 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 pesticides to kill them with. You have to use man-made or synthetic products like Seven or Bayer vegetable spray, which has the pyrethroid. 
So if you have this problem, I mean, we could spray oils and soaps till we're pretty much uh, blue in the face. Uh, you're not, one, not gonna be effective in killing them. And two, because they're transient, they're gonna be, you spray today, that product's working for today and they arrive tomorrow. So, you know, just that fact that they're hard to kill uh, because they have hard external uh, exoskeleton, uh, you know, you're gonna have to use some kind of man-made uh, synthetic insecticide. Uh, a big culprit for tomatoes, it seems like we never can grow a tomato crop without having some level of spider mites. Uh, these are not insects, although we discuss them when we discuss insects. Insects have six legs or three pairs of legs. Uh, um, mites have, or these mites have eight pair of legs, I mean, eight legs or four pairs of legs. And what we wanna look for uh, spider mites is that webbing, you know, that spider type webbing, uh, that kind of characteristic uh, type feeding that we call stipling, which is when you look at those leaves there on the uh, left side of the, of the picture there, that whitish looking thing, that's what we call style. That's a kind of a characteristic way that they feed on. Uh, again, there are several uh, types of spider mites. Probably the most common spider mites attacking tomatoes are two spotted spider mites, which they, you look at the picture there uh, at the uh, top uh, right picture, uh, there's two spots on that mite. And if you count the legs, there's eight total legs. Those little round BB looking things are the eggs of the mites. So also when you have a hand lens, you could be uh, scouring and looking for these BB looking type things. And those are mite eggs. And we also have red spider mites, which the mite itself is a different species. And, and it's entirely, totally red. Again, they'll have the BB shaped uh, eggs, but except they'll be red. And um, so these mites, uh, are not insects, so we don't use insecticides to control them. We use miticides. Uh, you know, we used to have miticides in the past that were available to homeowners. Uh, they've pretty much been taken off the market, um, you know, for years now. So really what we're left for the homeowner is to spray liquid sulfur. Sulfur is very effective on mites, on any crop. The only thing is, some tomato varieties and some crops are sensitive to sulfur. But in my experience, all the tomato varieties I've ever dealt with, I've never seen any phytotoxic effects due to using sulfur on them to control your mite. Again, you wanna get good coverage, uh, repeated applications to get your mite uh, problem under control. Now I'll talk about another uh, mite that's not in the spider mite group, and this is the tomato russet mites. And these are four legged mites. Remember I mentioned, or two pairs of total legs. So these have four legs, they don't have eight legs. These are what we call the aerial mites, meaning they're actually blown by the wind. Uh, so the other one's gotta move somehow. They don't, spider mites don't fly. They gotta be moved, you know, maybe they're in the soil or wherever they may be. Uh, but these particular mites here are actually blown from plant to plant or place to place by the wind because they're so tiny. As you can see there, the measurement is 100 microns. So without a very good hand lens and without a sharp eye, you're not going to see these mites. But you might see the damage that they cause. And part of that damage would be that stifling feeding uh, you may look through there you don't see any you know spider mites any eight-legged mites you just can never find any eight-legged mites uh, but they there will be no webbing but the feeding damage is similar as you can see on the underside of that leaf uh, to the left that it has that kind of whitish stipling uh, type feeding so they do that they can also attack the fruit and basically call it to russet meaning it gets brown and hard. Uh, so you can have a tomato fruit that you see that gets, uh, the exterior gets brown and hard. We call that russeting. And that was, the, that was due to the tomato russet mite. Just like the eight-legged mites, uh, sulfur is effective against them. So again, you'd want to spray sulfur. 
So those are just some of the few insect and mite problems that we, you know, commonly encounter on tomatoes, uh, especially down here in the Rio Grande Valley. And so that, that'll be uh, my portion for the insect and mite. I'll just briefly discuss diseases. Uh, you know, you can't talk about, um, you know, tomatoes without talking about diseases and, and, uh, and of course insects, but, you know, sometimes we can confuse some disease symptoms with some insects. So I do want to kind of cover that. First disease is a bacterial disease, which is caused by a bacteria and that's bacterial spec. And if you look at the damage to the leaf, uh, you have a lot of spotting, uh, blackening, maybe you don't have that yellow halo around the leaves, but you just uh, have a lot of spotting. And eventually all that spotting uh, or speckling due to the bacteria uh, will cause that leaf to die. And if it's so severe, the whole plant will die. And of course it can also even get on the fruit, uh, the bacteria, bacterial speck disease, get on the fruit and you can have the black specks on the fruit. But what we're concerned is at least managing the disease to a level um, that, the, that, you know, that you continue to have good production and the plant doesn't die. I'll move on to a couple of other diseases and these ones are caused by fungi. This disease was caused by a bacteria. So, you know, bacteria and fungi are two different microorganisms. Although for disease control purposes or management purposes, we're gonna be using the same product because we're limited on what we can use. For commercial tomato uh, production, uh, there are other bacteria sites and there are other fungicides that could be used uh, to, to manage uh, diseases in, uh, in tomatoes. So the first and most famous disease of tomatoes is early blight. It will also have those kind of that ring shape that we talked about in tomato spotted wilt, but you'll notice that that ring is not a perfect circular ring as in tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, that picture on the upper right hand corner is just an alternary spore on the, um, uh, being magnified under a microscope. You're not going to see that unless you put it under a microscope, but you know, your local plant pathologist can grab that leaf, uh, you know, put it on a slide and, and tell you immediately that you have uh, alternaria or early blight. Again, um, this disease can be uh, extremely devastating if the conditions are right and actually uh, eventually kill your tomato plant if you don't manage it. Uh, next disease that probably I'd say many homeowners have probably seen in their tomatoes, especially under humid type conditions uh, is leaf mold caused by cladosporium. You'll see this grayish uh, frothy growth of a fungus on the underside of the leaves uh, uh, due to probably too much canopy, due to rain, due, due to humidity, due to nutrition, many, many uh, factors, you know, that might be ideal for this leaf mold, but I would probably say most tomato uh, growers have probably encountered this disease. Again, that upper right-hand picture is just a picture of the uh, cladosporium spores under a microscope. You're not going to see that. But again, a plant pathologist or you, even with the symptoms that we're seeing, we're gonna be able to tell you what you got. So again, just like the insects, I'm not gonna go through all of, the, all of the diseases in tomatoes. I just went through some of the more common ones that I kind of encountered. Again, uh, there's way many more out there uh, and just be aware of, you know, at least for commercial growers, you know, are we dealing with a bacterial or fungal disease? That's very important as to what product we apply. But for homeowners, that's not gonna be the case. Again, uh, these diseases pretty much start on the foliage, but some of them end up on the fruit. So again, uh, we're trying to protect the foliage and then have a healthy plant. Uh, these diseases are very much weather dependent, especially with rains and high humidity. So, you know, if uh, rains are occurring, it's probably time to be breaking out your, um, your treatment regime. And again, you wanna rotate uh, these regimes and the regimes that I've listed are all organically certified uh, 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 
we'll say uh, uh, pesticides. And the first one is li liquid copper fungicide. Uh, copper is very effective against bacteria, but it also can help with fungi. Oxidate, which is basically a peroxide type product uh, is effective against bacteria and fungi. And it has an organic certified uh, label. And there's also a, uh, another bio-rational called Regalia. All three of these products you can get from your um, seed catalogs. Uh, and they are organically uh, certified, so they would qualify as organic type products. Again, just like the insecticides, I would recommend some kind of rotation, not just an exclusive one. And, uh, and, and that's going to help manage your disease problem. So what would be your, your take home message after everything that I've mentioned? Well, you wanna plant the best adapted varieties for your area. Again, you wanna get with your county agent or your vegetable specialist or the person helping you out. Like for example, in this case, maybe Dr. Masabni, uh, you might wanna be aware of that there are uh, tomato yellow leaf curl virus and tomato spotted wilt resistant varieties. Uh, they've turned out to be uh, Texas superstar plants uh, for Texas in many instances. So those are the varieties that we know are, I guess, multi-purpose, uh, do well across the state. So uh, be aware of those varieties. Uh, do not plant next to abandoned old tomato plants. Uh, that is kind of maybe more common here in South Texas where we might have a mild winter and people are still having their tomato plant uh, produce and grow through the winter time. And here comes spring and they're planting their new tomatoes, except they have a gigantic tomato plant that's full of disease and full of insects. And they don't want to get rid of that tomato plant because they have hope that that plant will produce something. And, you know, they're just creating, you know, that disease or insects uh, a home to basically survive and basically jump to the new crops. So you want to destroy your crops uh, your tomato crops and any other crops as soon as possible that you're done and, and try to keep it, um, you know, uh, plant free. Uh, identify the problem. You know, again, this is very critical. What, you know, which insect is it? Is it a mite problem? Is it a disease problem? And then if you spray, you know, spray, um, you know, if necessary, if you feel that it's necessary, I'm not going to go through thresholds or, you know, I would say once you see something in the garden, it's time to spray if you observe it. Uh, again, you wanna maintain your tomato plants as healthy as possible. That deals with fertility, uh, micronutrients, uh, not stressing it with water. Uh, you also don't want to over fertilize because that could create its own set of problems with some of these pests. Uh, so again, maintaining uh, plants healthy with fertility and water correctly done is gonna help and of and in some instances, you know, using reflective plastic mulches, especially UV reflective plastic mulches, uh, can help with some of these insect uh, pest problems. Personally, I like to use white plastic. Uh, I've tested white plastic, black plastic, and bare ground. Whether it's in the spring or fall, white plastic always outdoes them. Always outdoes them. So whether it's the light that it's reflecting back or or whatever the case might be, I think. Uh, using plastic mulches helps improve your chances of getting uh, lots of tomatoes from your tomato plants. And with that, I'll be glad to entertain any questions from the chat box. Uh, Joe, if you could read them out to me, I'd appreciate that.